Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Christine Passarella. She's an innovative educator and the founder of what I think is a tremendous program called Kids for Coltrane, referring, of course, to the great John Coltrane. Thanks for joining me today, Christine. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Rob. I really appreciate this opportunity. So we're talking here on the 21st of June. The pandemic has run through society. Our economy is quite off balance. The horrific episodes, high, or what you might call accented by the phrase, I can't breathe, and George Floyd, are kind of ripping at the roots of the fabric of our society. And I'm curious, from your vantage point, and we'll, we'll talk about education and John Coltrane uh, very intimately in this process, but what I do really want to hear from you, from your own sense, is what do you see going on? What concerns you? What surprises you? And how ultimately, over the course of this hour, we're going to create some light at the end of the tunnel based on your insights and experience. So where, how, how has the pandemic, how have events that are before us, how would I say, disturbed you and inspired you? Where, where are you at? Well, uh, it's very heavy. Um... It's heartbreaking watching George Floyd die the way he did, watching him murdered and the world watch. It just took away the veil of any hypocrisy that our citizens were engaged in. We're viewing something that is systemic and it was done in a way that we can all see. We know that that wasn't an experience or a situation that's unique. We know that decades and decades of African-American people, especially African-American men have been murdered that way. And so, it was really hard to watch, but and my heart goes out to the family and to, the, to George's soul. But in this moment, I think God brought change. And in that change, there's hope. And in where the hope is coming from, and in a magnificent way, is watching the young people of America say, truly say enough is enough. And I, I, and the hope also comes from, I think it's because our young people are very loving and very caring for the most part. And they don't hold these prejudices and this hate. And they don't want a life or a world that has all of this negativity in it. So I see goodness in this horrible moment. And the pandemic itself, for me, being a very spiritual person, even though there's horror in the, so many people dying, it's a wake-up call for our society to ask, for our society to look in the mirror. John Coltrane looked in the mirror for his own growth. So we as a Globally, we look in the mirror and say, who do we want to be as human beings? And uh, we have an opportunity to get better. I don't know if we'll have another opportunity to get better. Maybe this is the last opportunity. And it's such a drastic wake-up call. So although it's heartbreaking, there's hope in it. And I was so sad 
I have two adult children and I, I, um, they're staying with me throughout the pandemic. And one morning I was so sad. I, I just told them I have to go to the cemetery and pray. And I just sat at John Coltrane's resting place to just pray because I was in so much pain and his spirit seems to always, I don't know what it is exactly, and that's put in words, bring me hope and direction. And um, so I, I have to believe there's a light, that there's good people on this planet, that we could come together and make the change for our children and the future children that we don't know, you know, a future that we don't know. But we, we as a people must do better. Um, so I, I do have hope in my heart. I do. Yeah. One of the things that, and I want to get deeper into how you found inspiration in John Coltrane and it became at, at the, how I say, the core of your teaching. But I, I want to leap into a particular place in light of what you've just been saying. John Coltrane was very illuminating about the resistance to change and the nature of what a creative person must be like. Mm -hmm. can, can you share with us a little bit of how he, what you might call, girded himself to be creative, to go beyond the resistance, to go to places where he was gentle and loving and also ferocious at the same time, unyielding. Well, I, I, I'm certain that all of us who, I, I won't even say our fans, are who love John Coltrane, hear in his music that change. And when we examine his childhood, we go through the timeline of his life, we see how he grows, how he meets these challenges, these human challenges. Um, little boy losing so many of his elders at a, a short period of time and has to face a race its country on his own but seems to do it in such a loving, gentle way. And he tells a story, he tells his heart, he expresses himself through his music. And that music in itself develops. He has his heroes, he, you know, whether it's you know, Charlie Parker, he's following the greats of his time, but at some point collaborates with Miles, Miles Davis. But at some point he takes off and creates. And what he creates is what's inside his soul. He creates his prayers. He creates his love. And because he's so magnificent, because he's so brilliant, because he's so disciplined, he has an ability to share his humanity, I think, in ways we wish we all could. But it's very rare to have that kind of genius and that kind of love. So John keeps pushing himself to change. And it's hard for him, too. But... He can't do anything else but change. He can't stay still. He has to keep moving forward and risk. And that is such a unique thing to see. So many people we know find a place and they stay there and they live their life in that one place of security. I mean, John could have done that, certainly, but he doesn't. And... So his music is a gift because it's so magnificent. But his example as a human being 
is also a blueprint, if you will, for those of us who are creative, who are innovative, who believe that we are here to make some kind of difference, whatever it is. And so, you know, by following John, uh, I know personally, he gave me the courage to just keep moving forward and, and share that, because I, I was blessed to teach for many years, to share that with my students, so young. And they needed that too. They, they, they connected to that immediately, which was amazing for me to see, because it was so little. Um, and then the older kids as well. I mean, I taught from pre-K through eighth grade. So John has a philosophy. And part of that philosophy was changing and growing. He insisted on that for himself. And he did it with such love and sweetness that um, I don't think I mean, I feel like I know him. <laughs> I was almost mm -hmm. to say I, I never met anyone like him, but I, I never actually met him. But I met him through his music. And um, mm -hmm. he's at the highest level of humanity as far as I'm concerned. There are many uh, dimensions of Coltrane's music that have moved me. But as I was listening to you, I was recalling the uh, release of Kind of Blue in the European tour where Miles Davis, because John had been on the record, uh, kind of blew, they went on tour. And they were, there's a concert at the Olympia Theater in Paris mm -hmm. where you can feel every time the solo turns to John, he just takes off. Mm -hmm. And there are times when the audience, you can hear booing because they want to hear all the familiar licks from kind of blue. And I remember Quincy Troop writing in conjunction with Miles Davis, and they were kind of enjoying the fact that this guy had reached this kind of liftoff point, mm. and they and they knew it was the end of his time mm. in Miles's band as he was creating Giant Steps and then My Favorite Things and and so forth. But that that track. Uh, and I, I remember there's a version of Bye Bye Blackbird on that record. Gorgeous. And, and yeah. you can just feel him take off, just mm -hmm. go mm -hmm. almost like, like just frenetic. And you, and, and like you said, he's a gentle man. He's not trying to, it's not like a ego contest. Mm -mm. It, it's, he's gone in deep and, and this is what he's meant to create or produce in right. yeah. the, the reflection of his spirit. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I found the evolution of Coltrane, particularly in the realm of free jazz and his working with people like Pharaoh Sanders and Ornette Coleman and others to be quite inspiring because he was number one in the downbeat poll. He could be making, in those days, real good money playing his hits and whatever, kind of audience-pleasing. But I think he wanted to take his audience on a journey. And he just never, he never stopped creating. And I, think, I think that's really true. And I, I, I am certain that as he, he, he died so young, was, as he got older, um, as he moved on in his life, I'm sure being surrounded by such creative musicians or he put himself in a position where he was surrounded by such creative musicians mm -hmm. had to be very uplifting for him as well. Um, yeah. And uh, that was beautiful to see that he had, he knew, and I think it's a lesson for all of us, you know, to surround yourself with people who could push you, who are like-minded, but are also have something new to offer you and and and, and right. not be competitive to bring the best of people around you so you could grow and challenge each other it's kind of like it's kind of like a tough love yeah. in a way that it's unsettling but you have faith that it's there to help you grow that's right yeah and it's a it's a beautiful thing and to see it done musically is such a gift mm -hmm. for all of us so let's now uh, where did you 
get what you might call blessed with the inspiration of John Coltrane. What is that process? How did that come to fruition that led you on the path that we'll explore in the next 45 minutes to an hour? Wow. I'll tell you, I am incredibly blessed and I don't know if I'll ever understand how John Coltrane came into my life the way he did, but I believe God sent John Coltrane to me through my prayers, even though I didn't even know what I was praying for. Um, but I know I was praying for help. I was praying for love. I was praying for support. I was praying for understanding. And I'll go back to briefly when I was a little girl, I came from a loving family, but a family in which girls did not have equal rights. And ever since I can remember, uh, my earliest memory, I was being told, you'll never get what your brother gets and all this. Um, and my parents were proud of me, but no matter what I did, I was quote unquote, just a girl. And so I was born in 1957. And that was actually the year, you know, John Coltrane had a spiritual awakening. So I, I love that I learned that it was in 1957 because that meant something to me. And it was disheartening to me, but I never gave up. I worked hard. I was very studious and um, always sort of the best in my class. Very quiet, kid, but very bright. So I had confidence. My father gave me confidence, but no matter what I did, I, I couldn't, I wasn't a boy. And so I learned early on that being judged by what you look like um, is a negative thing. So young. And so I just, school was my salvation. And at 14 years old, a traumatic thing happened to me. I write about it in a little essay called The Story of My Two Cousins. And my cousin, Frankie, uh, passed away early. He was only 18 from uh, the effects of heroin. And it devastated me. He was very close to me, like a brother. And then I had another cousin who's a phenomenal thespian, John Turturro, who's brilliant and fantastic. And I analyzed in my life as I would move forward, how did we lose Frankie? And what made John just soar? And... I have to say they're both deeply loved for sure. But with John, I noticed something in his mother's love. She locked eyes with her son in a way that made him know that he could do whatever he wanted. And he said to me that it wasn't that she praised him so much or anything like that. She just believed in him. And she was there for him. And I remember talking to her and, and she was just the kindest woman, very supportive of uh, teachers and, and, and education. But what John said to me, I had interviewed him for an article I did and he said, but she wasn't over the top. She didn't, she wasn't like that. She just said, if he had an idea, she would say, go for it. And there was something in that. There's something in that, that every child should have parents who believe in their uniqueness. And every, and, and uh, as a teacher, I'm, I'm with my students for hours and hours a day. And if you have a teacher that doesn't have that same belief in their student, there's not only a missed opportunity, it's a tragedy and a crime if teachers don't believe in their students in that way. So that's what I was trying to bring into my classrooms, that, that love, that belief, um, that creativity, a, a home away from home, if you will. And um, I did that. I, I, I went to Brooklyn College at first, got a degree in economics, 
worked on in the Wall Street area for Peter John Galandris, who's a Greek shipping tycoon. My father was very proud of me. And, and, I, and I, I was successful, but I, I said to my father one day, I'm leaving to teach. And he was very disappointed in me. And I think that was my first <laughs> rebellion. Um, mm -hmm. And I taught in Catholic school because you didn't need a license back then. And uh, taught science in kindergarten, all different subjects. And um, my first day teaching, I explained to the students what class would be like. And one child, I'll never forget, raised her hand and said, you must be new because school wasn't like this. But I, I wasn't trained. I, did, I didn't come from a, a, a school that said teachers do this. I, I was free to create, and I did that. And eventually I got my licenses. I went to Adelphi, I got my master's. I went to um, LIU, CW Post. I got my degree in um, uh, school district administration, my principal's license, my superintendent's license, all that stuff. And I had a great mentor at Delphi who also uh, taught me that I, these wonderful project learning environments were good. And uh, we flourished. I always used art in my classroom. Examination of great art in my classroom as a liaison to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for my school. Had a wonderful principal, Joan Weingarten, who pushed me in that direction. It was fantastic. And uh, music flowed and all that. And at one point in the early 2000s, I started to use the music of John Coltrane. I started to listen to Coltrane myself. I was in a, a, a major car accident on the LIU on, in New York. A gentleman made a U-turn on the LIU and came in the wrong direction. And um, my life flashed before my eyes. I changed my life after that, got a divorce, we went through the process of divorce and was wondering about the meaning of life. It was around that time that John Coltrane's music appeared in my life. And um, I started to listen to it. First, I went to the library and I just took every CD out. <laughs> and then I bought my own collection. Right. And I started to bring my music to the students. And uh, at this point, I had a first grade class, shared Coltrane with them. And I remember a friend said, that's a little you know, complex for little kids. But I put on the album, The Best of John Coltrane, which is filled with wonderful music children to relate to. And um, magic appeared, just appeared. There was a soothing beauty in John's music that the children related to and they absolutely adored. And uh, second year, the parents asked to have me again as a teacher, so they looped me. And um, we were able to develop the Kids for Coltrane program. I wondered, as I got to know John's music, what is going on in America with the, I have a lot of musician friends, and they, of course, all knew John, but the school teachers didn't know who John was and so on. So I wondered, this was um, like 2006, what was going on in our country if one of the most magnificent musicians to ever have walked the earth is not known by every American citizen? So I set out to raise his profile in America. I know that sounds, um, I don't know what it sounds like, but it, it was important to me to do that. Uh, people from uh, the Jazz at Lincoln Center Educational Program helped me out. A lot of people, Jazz Foundation of America helped me out. A lot of people got involved in the Kids for Coltrane. So we decided to do a program, uh, not a program, we decided to do a show to raise money, the children and I, because I love doing productions with the children, plays, singing, all of that. So we decided to do our program and raise money for the, we heard there was a home on Long Island that was being turned into a museum. I got in touch with the founder of that project, Steve Falgoni, 
and he came with his uh, board and they watched our show and uh, I think we raised $1,500 or $2,000 and we donated it to them. I met Ravi Coltrane through the process and uh, the children and I vowed one day when the museum comes to pass, uh, when, it, when, it, when it's here, when it's this project comes together, which is still working on, we will all meet one day <laughs> at the museum. And, and now I'm part of that, uh, I'm their education chair. So that's an interesting side note. But um, so, yeah, that was one of the things that I, I it was like, I didn't understand how this great man wasn't known by everyone. And truth be told, I wondered if it didn't have something to do with racism in our country. And so I pushed and I pushed. Well, the curriculum was magnificent. I think I'm a great teacher. And, um, but by the time the Bloomberg administration came in, there was a shift in the way teachers could teach. And there was a push back. The, the, the administration tried to stop my work. One day, um, and this is where some of these mentors come in. Um, Nat Hentoff, before I get into that, Nat Hentoff heard about the production the children and I were doing. And one day I get a phone call, and uh, it's Nat Hentoff on the phone. I'll never forget. He said, This is Nat Hentoff from the Wall Street Journal. And um, we had a deep conversation, and he became my mentor until the day he died. And he was John Coltrane's friend. So he helped me a lot. He, he warned me. He taught me. He was an amazing human being. One day when I was disheartened by the system changing, when I was being told by administration not to bring Coltrane in, my posters were ripped down and I had blues posters and jazz posters up. They were literally ripped down by the administration. Um, my daughter, who's a feminist, a uh, wonderful, brilliant young woman, took me to an event where Anita Hill was speaking. And um, I said a few words to Anita Hill, and one of them was Coltrane, the main coach. And she looked up at me, she was signing books, and she locked eyes with me, and she said, don't you stop. At this mm. point, I don't know how to continue because administration is trying to stop the work. And so I, I think it was the next day I went into the principal and I said, I want to do an after school program. And um, the principal said, no, you have, there's no money. And I said to her, I don't need money. So I just, for a few years after that, I did this beautiful after school program. Wendy Oxenhorn from the Jazz Foundation of America sent jazz musicians into my classroom. Live music was, would, would be flowing out of my classroom. It was just unbelievable. And I just kept finding a way. And uh, the children would sign up for the after school program. And I just, whatever way I could bring Coltrane into the classroom, I did. Because I saw that his music, his spirit, his love, had this profound effect on them. And that, and I want to say, you know, I called it Kids for Coltrane. Nat and I called it Kids for Coltrane. But there was a reason. I didn't call it Coltrane for Kids, which I could have. Mm -hmm. But what That's I felt was these children were saying, the youth, they were saying, we want John Coltrane. We want this type of love. We're insisting on Coltrane. It's the kids who are pulling John Coltrane close to them. And um, it was a magnificent thing. And, and I, I, I don't think it's that complex because all I'm offering is a loving environment using whatever a teacher thinks is beautiful. In my case, it was John Coltrane. Um, and... and you know, he personally means so much to me. I mean, I've, I, I have to say at this point in my life, I've dedicated my life to John Coltrane. My children mm -hmm. will tell you that. 
Um, so. let's, t let's talk a little bit about how the children react and at what ages do you start to introduce John Coltrane and, and at the different, what might call phases in education, how does their attachment to his spirit evolve? Well, it, it's interesting because I, I did it. I did the program in, in different ways. I even had something called the jazz breakfast cafe. The children would come in and have breakfast with jazz music. It was just extraordinary. But it started with children who were six years old and analyzing um, music like um, Central Park West or Naima. You know, it, it, not, not that complex, beautiful music, but they could relate to it. They were able to see the story in the music and talk about it related to their own lives. It's really vital that when I used to do this thing when the kids would come in, I call it clear the deck. They would just walk in and start writing. No pressure. You know, they just write. And they were able to share if they wanted to. And it was just sort of making them know that they mattered. I cared about their life, their emotions. And so we would connect to John's stories, uh, John's mute songs, and there were stories in those songs. Um, and they absolutely loved that. I remember one little girl was on the computer just doing research on his life. At that point, she's seven. She just loved doing the research, and she would come and we would have these centers. I would let you know the children would would they would they would do their research. They would go play chess, different things during the day, and um, she just so young invested her energy in learning more and more about who this man was. And I have to tell you, many years later, when I was doing another form of the program before I left before the Bloomberg administration um, just drained me from the attacks, you know. Um, they were just trying to stop the work in, in every which way but Tuesday. But I remember I was doing a program, I was teaching 500 kids a week, a music literacy program, Coltrane's music. And a little boy who was so thrilled to be in my class, he heard about me, you know, my work was in the Wall Street Journal, it was in the New York Times. So there was like a little bit of a buzz about me. So when the kids got into my, my class, they were excited. And this was now a music program. It wasn't my regular class. They gave me a cluster class at this point. And um, a little boy, I think he was in kindergarten. He, he was listening to the music and I held up a picture. It was a little African-American boy. And he just looked at me and said, you mean he's black like me? And there's, there's something very powerful in that moment for all of us, for all, for educators, for this. There's something there that we have to explore. And I, I have my opinion about how we could change the system, you know, attached to this moment from, the, from so many experiences. But yeah. There were many people that came into my life when I needed them, um, including uh, Dr. Cornell West. Who... Yes, he's been a guest on this podcast. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, how do I say? I think he is, might be the king of lateral pattern recognition across all kinds of artistic, social science, theological, poetic realms. He, he's just brilliant. Yeah. Just brilliant. He is a gift. He's a gift to humanity, in my opinion. I consider him one of my dearest friends. And briefly, I could tell you that it was one day I came home from work, disheartened by uh, what was going on in, the, in um, the school system under the Bloomberg administration, Joe Klein administration, he was a chancellor, where they were changing teaching in a way that was shocking to me. And I signed up for a lecture by Dr. Cornel West called Moral Courage. I have to be honest, I didn't know too much about Dr. West at the time. Um, my son told me about his work, actually. So I, I signed up. I went over to, um, I think it was at NYU he was speaking. And uh, I just heard this magnificent person talk about life, 
try again, fail again, fail better. All these, all this energy came from this meeting. But on my way there, I knew I was sent. I can't tell you what it is. I knew I had to be there. I didn't know why. And all of a sudden, Cornel West talks about his love for John Coltrane, which I had no idea. <laughs> I almost yeah. fell off my chair. So my daughter lived, she was at, going to Columbia at the time. She was on the Upper West Side. So I was leaving the building and it was over and I was like sort of stunned um, that Dr. West mentioned Coltrane and I was on my way out to go to, go to my daughter's and someone said at NYU, you know, they're serving coffee in the ballroom. It was a big ball. So I, you know, I was tired. I said, let me go get coffee. And then Dr. West came in passed me by again i'm shy so i get a, something pushed me to go over <laughs> to say hi i was he was in, surrounded by a bunch of people chatting as you know people see cornell and they're all uh, thrilled so he i saw his shoulders lift and he turned and looked at me and later on he said to me I, I felt you before I saw you. And he pulled mm. me into the circle and I mentioned, and my daughter said, just do an elevator speech, mom, just say. <laughs> so I said, John Coltrane, kids of Coltrane, you know, I said. And he pulled me in and he said, I'm gonna help you. And the next day he called and the rest is history. He became my mentor, my friend, and educated me in ways I, I can't, I couldn't have learned from anybody else. So that's one of the miracles. And, and I, in yeah. fact, introduced Cornell to Nat Hentoff one day. So that was thrilling for me. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> now, as I recall, Nat Hentoff was a friend of Malcolm X. Yes. Yeah. And I know that Cornell absolutely reveres Malcolm X. And Cornell, I mentioned his gifts of lateral pattern integration and recognition. He fuses arts with politics and culture yes. as well as any human being I've ever encountered. And I'm curious when what what was the chemistry when Nat Hendolf met Cornell West? <laughs> well, it was magnificent. Uh, it was an out of body experience for me. Um, I was there was a documentary. Oh. I forgot the name of it. I apologize. Uh, about Nat. Oh, I know. I know what I. It? Yeah, I do, I do. The pleasure of being out of step. That's it. That's it. Yeah, so, I watched that recently. Yes. So that was a thank you. And um, so we went to the premiere, and Nat didn't know I was bringing Cornell West, right? And so Nat didn't even know I was there. I just. I think I asked a question, and then and that was in the front. We were toward the back, and um, he said, "Oh, Miss Passarella's here, you know, Christine Passarella's here." And he said, and I was so proud that he said this in front of Dr. West. He said, "Her work could change education as we know it." I was so proud that Dr. West heard that. And wow, after yeah. the the film was over. We went down and um, I was just thrilled, but it was interesting because at that point it didn't matter that I was there at all. Nat's son was like, oh my God, Cornel West is here. <laughs> and that was just so thrilled to see Dr. West and um, his son, Nat's son was thrilled. He, he really, Nat Hentoff really admired um, Cornell and rightfully so. And, uh, and as you could imagine, to have two mentors believe in me through this work is is bigger it's bigger than me as a person it's not just it's not just my life it's my purpose it, it just makes me realize that I'm on the right track and to keep as Coltrane did keep changing keep going keep going forward have that courage bring in the right people to work with you and also let go of the people who don't. And eventually in 2014, the end of 2014, with a conversation with Cornel West, 
I agreed uh, with him that it was time for me to retire early from the system if I was ever going to bring this to the next level. And I, I did do that. Let's let's talk about uh, in your endeavor. You have this circle of people who are very illustrious and creative mm. and supportive, but as you go into the plumbing of education systems that have been at some level privatized, at some level kind of rigid, rigidified, if you will, mm. in lots of testing, lots of monitoring, lots of ranking exactly. and controls rather than touching the heart and drawing inspiration like you've been sharing with me in this conversation. What kind of resistances did you experience even when people in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times are lauding this wonderful creation called Kids with Coltrane, and when in a world where what you might call overcoming the original sin of slavery after 400 years and all the animosity and the unconscious resistance to creating a loving community, yeah. it's almost like you're what the doctor ordered. Yes. It, where did the resistance come from? How was it manifest? Well, I, I could tell you my experience. And from that, you could extrapolate what you will. But uh, so I'll, I'll just tell you what happened. Around the time Bloomberg came in with Joel Klein, they created a program or a, a way of bringing principles into the system called the Leadership Academy. Now, if you recall, I said I had my superintendent's license and um, my principal's license, I have a, a professional diploma in that expertise, which took me about two and a half years at CW Post. And around the same period of time, Bloomberg comes in with Joel Klein and they create this thing called the Leadership Academy. I, I don't, I didn't understand at the time what was happening. I did research after. But what they did was they made a way that they could handpick people to become principals they wouldn't have to go through the educational uh, programs like I did. They would just have to go through the Bloomberg Klein uh, program. And they assign these uh, people principal jobs. And those principals came in. One of them was mine. Um, and um, around the time I started to do Coltrane, a little bit after a little bit after. Um, I was already in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. And so this new principal comes in, very little experience as a teacher. I don't think any experience as a principal except shadowing a principal. And she started to stop my work every which way she could. And it took me a while to realize, I mean, there's probably, people say to me, it was probably more than one reason that, um, a creative teacher is stopped. But I then started to make a connection to this rote way that Bloomberg and Klein wanted education to be, this way to, you know, numbering children and, and uh, testing, testing, testing. It, it was just uh, heartbreaking. I mean, I could give you an example. We were supposed to do a program over at uh, Jazz Lincoln Center in the education room. It was all set up. That was coming. My friend Barry Mayo, who is the uh, was a radio executive, who is also incredibly supportive, and I met him also in a very magnificent way through um, sort of a spiritual uh, similar to Cornell, where when I needed someone to believe in the work, I met him on a train when I was reading a book about John Coltrane, unbeknownst to me, he was this huge radio executive who believed in me and told me to keep going. Um, so he was coming, that Hentoff was coming, and it was just beautiful. And right before, I think it was a few weeks before, I get a, a call or an email, you can't, you, you can't do that. You, your students cannot go to Jazz at Lincoln Center and perform. It was shocking to me. I reached out to the superintendent at the time, Anita Saunders, 
and she said, oh, it has to do with legal, legal ramifications. We need a year in advance to let you go to Jazz at Lincoln Center. It just sounded absurd to me. But they were my bosses, and that was that. At the very end of my career, I was doing a program over in the city. Uh, I mean, I still have a career, but not in the city I left. Um, I was doing a show called New York Loves, and we were going to invite Cornel West and Harry Belafonte, and it was just beautiful. The kids were singing amazing songs, The Bells of New York City. It was just lovely. And um, I got an email that said, you cannot do this show. Cornel West came mm -hmm. to my school to talk to my students, a Socratic round table discussion. It was beautiful. The principal barely gave him attention or recognition or anything. So I don't know the answer, but I know that this, that administration wanted the work stopped. But I kept going on because it was just so magnificent and the, the parents loved it, the kids loved it. Um, and then, but then eventually I had enough and I knew that I couldn't grow it anymore. And uh, that's when I made the decision to leave. And hopefully, hopefully bring the work to other districts throughout America. Nat Hentoff believes in it, Cornel West believes in it, many people believe in it, my students who I'm still in touch with believe in it. So um, I'm hoping to find a way to bring this curriculum that I developed to children all over America and who knows, maybe all over the world. Well, that, uh, how would I say, that brings us back to the, the current challenge. The, which I, I, I'm going to use a kind of shallow metaphor, but like the operating system that is loaded into the American mind tolerates racism, a criminal justice system, hmm. a, a way of discriminating, a way of neglecting that is a hundred thousand miles away from the kind of love that John Coltrane's work uh, encourages or represents or infuses into you. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would call what he does a vaccination of the heart. That's beautiful. And it's fortifying the heart. And your teaching is a vaccination of the heart. And you're putting this into these young spirits. And I know from talking to you that your alumni from this Kids for Coltrane program go through life and reach back to you and want to help and bear witness. And that's right. And so I can feel the energy and I can see the awkwardness now. I have daughters just about in the fall will be in third and sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So they come just out of second and fifth. Mm -hmm. And I see their school grappling with how to explain this craziness and this racism and how to insulate the children a little bit from how horrific it is. And, you know, you were talking about this crisis creates like change and opportunity mm -hmm. and the young people have to embrace it and they seem to be doing so. But your vaccine is what the doctor ordered right now to transform young and old to get to the place where we leave this shameful, hideous tolerance of inhumanity behind us. And in the kind of secular STEM discipline technocratic, if you will, notion of what education is. It's like tools for performing in a capitalist system. That's right. And those tools, those tools are, are helpful. You you mm -hmm. studied them yourself. I That's heard right. you talking earlier. That's right. But but it's this moral compass. It's this 
infusion of awareness of right and wrong and balance that can't, I'm not talking about five children learning this. I'm talking about 40 years from now, 150 million people thinking differently. That's right. And how do we, how do we, that's why I was asking you about the resistances because I'm trying to understand given the magic potion that you've developed how we can disseminate it so that it what it widely inhabits the heart of the future american people well and, I, and, I, and, you, know, you mentioned malcolm x the yes the beautiful thing is now schools are mentioning malcolm x there yes. was a time when you couldn't mention malcolm x i of course was oh, i remember i even had dr king poster on, on in front of my room always making a connection to the, uh, uh, martin in, in, in coltrane and I remember a teacher came into my room and said you know the principal's not going to like this it's not black history month you should take that down the ignorance in the building was unbelievable and and, and it's not i'm not trying to be negative t- toward my colleagues but it was literally ignorance. And so we have to, I mean, some of it was racism, I'm sure, but some of it was ignorance. And so we have to re-educate the teachers um, or bring these beautiful programs to teachers. And let me say this, one of the things I did was I had a think tank for a while called the Illumination Cafe, where having gone to Harvard for six professional development opportunities to meet Howard Gardner and the Project Zero team and other wonderful things that they do at Harvard. And and I paid for that myself and all of this because I wanted to keep developing myself. Um, I was so impressed and inspired that I created a think tank in my classroom. And so I invited my colleagues and some of the, the most beautiful colleagues in my building would come to my classroom for lunch. At first, I bought the lunch. Then, then eventually, we all you know brought lunch together. And, um, I brought coffee, whatever I could you know do to get them, and into the room. But what what it was was respect for each other. It wasn't top down. It was a teacher respecting a teacher, having a conversation. I would just present an article or something I learned from Harvard, and then we would just have this beautiful. Uh, enlightening conversation about what we wanted for our kids. It was really wonderful. Lunch is lunchtime. And so I use it as a model to have an Illumination Cafe sort of um, professional development through the school systems throughout America, where teachers are respected for their brilliance. We have these educated teachers. Teachers have to get master's degrees and all this. But then there's this top-down squashing of their intellect that has to stop and so that's a piece of it respecting teachers in a way where they're able to bring their creativity to the to uh into the process um and then you know who do we hire make sure make sure just even what we're saying with the police force right we want to make sure we don't hire racist teachers and administrators let me be straight with you. You know, uh, Malcolm X, I'm, I'm reading a quote here. He said, education is our passport to the future, but tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for it today. Yes. But Baldwin would agree that who you put in front of the classroom is vital. Who your administrators are, this is vital. And so... I believe I ran into people for a variety of reasons. I have my opinion about it, that they wanted the work stopped. And part of my, my feeling was that I was honoring a great African-American genius and my work was named for him. So I put it out there. People could tell me, why, why, would, why would this system want that stopped. And so I think that Kids for Coltrane 
is very transformative. And the way I developed the curriculum wasn't, we don't just learn, I don't say just, but learning about Coltrane is huge, but it's also helping children develop their thinking skills through Coltrane, through great art. We, I, we even had law classes. We would do mock trials where the children would do cases. We'd make up these cute little, the case of the missing skateboard or whatever, and the kids would have to figure it out and think through a process. So I taught for understanding so that they could take that with them. Like you're, you're saying a vaccination for the heart, but it also helped the children think for themselves and question and collaborate and believe in themselves and their uniqueness. A lot of what I did was rooted in the work, which I fell in love with, uh, of Dr. Howard Gardner, uh, multi theory of multiple intelligences. I, I thought that was extraordinary, mm -hmm. extraordinary work. And, um, Again, to me, the answer is here in front of us. The question is, who's stopping it? Who's stopping it? You know, I also studied the work of Peter Senge, Systems Thinking, and I was, mm -hmm. I loved his work. He talks about personal mastery, mental models, shared vision, team learning. Again, it makes so much sense in a school, but that's not top down. That's sharing America with the teachers and the students and the parents. The answer seems clear to me, but the problem is there's a system that's stopping it. You know, race to the top and charter schools and, and not investing in public education. I'm a huge, huge fan of Diane Ravitch. Huge mm -hmm. fan. She gives the facts. Uh, in her latest book, um, I think it's called a slang Goliath. She talks about how Bloomberg and Gates are trying to take over education, but they're not educators. So this is a problem. And um, I think the kids for culture and curriculum can really make a difference if implemented in certain school districts. I think it'll grow and grow. Um, I saw it happen, you know, I witnessed it. And I just think I'm a vessel. I think God is working through me to get the work done with Coltrane genius all around me. Um, yes. That's how I feel. <laughs> well, let me uh, kind of bring things to a head here because I think you've covered a lot of ground and I'm sure we'll do other episodes together. But your mentor, Nate Hinoff, did write for the Wall Street Journal. And at the end of that article, he says, uh, he quotes John Coltrane. Mm. When you're playing with someone who has really something to say, even though they may otherwise be quite different in style, there's one thing that remains constant. And that is the tension of the experience, that electricity, that kind of feeling that is a kind of lift mm. kind of feeling. No matter where it happens, you know when that feeling comes upon you and it makes you feel happy. Yes. He then goes on to say that kind of happiness can lift listeners too. Mm. Listeners of any age, including second graders. That's right. I heard you bring one of my favorite thinkers, James Baldwin, into the conversation. And just as, uh, how would I say that you, you talked about a life of miracles. I really wanted to close with a quote from him about people who go inside themselves and they discover s secrets mm. and what they do with them. And he, here's what Baldwin says. Perhaps such secrets, the secrets of everyone were only expressed when the person laboriously drag them into the light of the world, mm. imposed them on the world, and made them a part of the world's experience. Without this effort, the secret place was merely a dungeon in which the person perished. Mm. Without this effort, indeed, the entire world would be in an uninhabitable darkness. Yeah. Christine, your work is fighting that darkness. 
your work is bringing that uplift that Nate Hentoff, your mentor, underscored in the conclusion of his writing about your program. And you're not content just to know and feel John Coltrane. You're using him to light up the hearts and the love and the consciousness of an entire society. I couldn't be more admiring thank you. of your work and of your purpose. Thank and I want to thank you for being here today and joining me and, and sharing with the INET audience something that's far, far beyond economics, which is where your degree started. And that gives me hope that there's there's great possibility for us all in following your example. I, I thank you so much, and I, I I'm so incredibly grateful for this opportunity to share. Thank you. Well, I'm very grateful that you chose us as a place in which to share, and I hope after a few months pass that we can reconvene. I'm sure we'll be working on projects together, whether in New York or Detroit or electronic versions of how you teach teachers to teach kids for Coltrane or just dissemination more broadly now that we're all on these electronic platforms. Mm -hmm. I see so many uh, exciting possibilities for you to realize that broader vaccination of the heart that you've described to me today. Thank you again, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.